This is an impulse signal. It's made up of a single sampled value of one in an infinitely long stream of zeros. Well, you can think about it as a burst of energy, which arrives really quickly and dissipates just as quickly. Suffice to say, a one sample burst of energy doesn't actually occur naturally, but it can be generated via code. A comparable example to an impulse would be clapping your hand or bursting a balloon. A very profound thing about this impulse signal is that this simple signal, this tiny one sample pulse, contains sinusoids of all possible frequencies representable for that sampling rate. This may be difficult to appreciate and certainly hard to grasp, but it practically contains all possible frequencies. Because of this property, the impulse signal is very useful in systems analysis, and in this particular series, filter analysis, as we'll soon see. But first, let's actually create an impulse signal and put its wild claim to the test. I'm going to use Python to create a test signal and subject it to spectrum analysis. I'll make the scripts available as Jupyter Notebook projects so that you may be able to interactively try these out on your own machines if you're interested. In another video, we can go through the scripts in more detail, but in this video, I'll brush past the details and get cracking. Here, I'll create a stream of zeros, say a length of 1024 samples. For the very first sample, I'll assign the value to be one. This is our impulse signal. And if we plot it, we can see the time domain graph of the impulse signal with a single peak. We can hear what it sounds like as well. I'm gonna take the stream of numbers and feed it into a function which will interpret it as sound. And we'll set the sampling rate to 44.1 kilohertz. Well, this is what it sounds like. Unimpressive, obviously. What do you expect? It sounds like a click or a glitch. Now, for the interesting part. If we take this impulse signal and subject it to Fourier analysis using the fast Fourier transforms of the FFT algorithm, we can then get the frequency domain analysis of the signal. The output of the FFT operation is a complex signal. And if we extract the real part of this signal and then plot it on a frequency domain graph, we get this, a straight line of magnitude one. This indicates that all the frequencies have a magnitude of one. And hence all of the frequencies of equal magnitude are present in this impulse signal quite wild if you ask me. We can use a more traditional spectrum analyzer to confirm this fact as well. We heard what the impulse sounded like. Let's just write this out into a wave file and I'll import it into Sonic Visualizer and open up the spectrogram. And we can see again that all frequencies are present. But why? We see from the plots that an impulse signal contains sinusoids of every frequency. There's no denying that. But how can we build our intuition towards this fact? Here's a demonstration that might help. I'll head over to the Desmos graphing calculator. And over here, let's plot a sinusoid. Y equal to cos of x. The reason why I'm using the cosine function here is because its peak falls at x equal to zero. This is a sinusoid with a frequency of one unit, let's say. Now, the idea here is to add sinusoids of several different frequencies together. So this is a sinusoid of frequency of two units, and three, and four, and five, and so on. We can see that for all of these sinusoids, the peak coincides at x equal to zero. So if we add all of them together, the peaks constructively interfere. Let's write a simple summation of n values where n goes from a value of one frequency unit to k frequency units, which is then controlled by a slider. As I increase k, we can see that the resulting plot has a local maximum at x equal to zero, it has the same at several different places as well, but let's just focus on x equal to zero. Since this plot will grow quite large, I'll normalize the values between negative one and one by just dividing the whole term with k.
And now, as we increase k, which increases the number of sinusoids being summed, with the maximum localized value constrained to a narrower region. This is now at k equal to 200, which means that 200 sinusoids of increasing frequencies are being summed. But as you can imagine, if you keep increasing the number of sinusoids being added further, as this number tends towards infinity, the plot tends to become a unit impulse. But we are in the digital domain after all, so sinusoids with an infinite frequency is not something that we can achieve. We are governed by the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, so if we were to take the sampling rate of let's say 400 hertz, we can only represent frequencies up to the Nyquist limit, which is 200 hertz. If we go by the Desmos calculator, we are already at the combination of sinusoids of up to 200 frequency units. But there isn't a single point like we saw in the impulse signal. Obviously, we are looking at this from the lens of a continuous time system. If we were to take this same signal and discretize it at the sampling rate of 400 Hz, we'd get a single point, since at that sampling rate, only one sample gets quantized to 1, and the rest of the samples are quantized to 0. I can quickly demonstrate this by adding an arbitrary number of sinusoids in the Python script. If you take a sampling rate of 400, and any frequency less than 200, and plot only a period of the waveform, we can see that in the discrete form, it's an arbitrary waveform. But as we approach a frequency closer to the Nyquist, closer to 200, we get a signal which closely resembles an impulse. And at exactly 200, we get exactly that. We get the impulse signal. So, what we see here is a continuous time equivalent of a discrete impulse signal. And this continuous signal has special significance, and it's called the sync function, or the sine cardinal function. The function definition of the sync function is basically sine of x over x. So here it would be sine of kx over kx. And it's quite similar to the summed cosines. In fact, if I change this term slightly, the two signals are equivalent. The sync function is quite useful in signal processing for a variety of reasons. But in this video, we'll see how a sync function in continuous time is actually just the impulse signal in discrete time. There are two general variants to the sync function. The unnormalized form, which is sine of x over x, and the normalized form, which is sine of pi x over pi x. The normalized form is the most useful form of the sync function in signal processing, and we can actually see why. At x equal to 1 on the number line, the sync function equates to 0. It's 0 at x equal to 2, and at x equal to 3, and x equal to 4. It's 0 as well. Going over to the negative axis, it's 0 at negative 1, negative 2, and so on. So at every integral point on the number line, except for x equal to 0, the value of the normalized sync function is 0. And we can imagine what this means in discrete time. In discrete time, we sample the signal and capture values at discrete intervals, like 1, 2, 3, and so on, and discard the values in between. So if we discretize this normalized sync function, we get an impulse signal. In the script, we previously got an impulse signal by summing up all the frequencies up to the Nyquist. But now, all we need is a single normalized sync function, and we get an impulse signal. We can see the form that the sync function would take if it was unnormalized, and it resembles the sync function that we saw in Desmos. But the normalized form results in a perfect impulse signal. So summing up, the impulse signal is a signal that comprises every frequency possible for a particular sampling rate. Because of this really unique property of impulse signals, you can imagine why they're so useful in systems analysis. If you pass an impulse signal through a filter, it is akin to passing every possible sinusoid through the filter. And once you get an impulse response as the output of that filter, 
It's akin to getting a frequency response for every possible frequency. If we compare these two frequency domain plots, we'll now get a fair idea of how this filter will behave to a specific frequency passed as an input. This has been a fairly long exposition of impulse signals. But now let's get back to what we were doing in the earlier video. We'll feed this impulse signal through our first order feed forward filter. 